Good morning and a warm welcome to all of you at the Horasis Asia meeting. I am Richard Reiki, former CEO of KPMG India and presently a board member of KPMG Lower Gulf. Today we will be having a discussion around India's investment policy. As we know, COVID-19 has disrupted all our lives. It has had significant disruptions around economic and financial landscape and beating the world into a sort of unforeseen economic recession. The ongoing tension of geopolitical and trade natures combined with shifts in monetary policy have been a big source of concern for investors in 2020. Global FDI inflows have fallen by 49% in the first half of 2020, owing to the economic fallout from COVID-19. This is the global uh, figures. While the developed economies have got much more impact, it has also helped, uh, it's also affected the developing countries like India. But this also has made a lot of companies relook at their strategies, relook at how they want to do their investments, and a lot of them are into a de risking strategy. And many of them are looking at diversifying from China, which is once in a while opportunity for India. So while India's investment policies is one of the best in the world, or it has been quite good over the last few years, I think further liberalization is required at this stage to attract these investors, Western investors to come to India. We also need to build our domestic capability to be able to take on this opportunity. And it would require a lot of uh, support from the government in ensuring that the things are put in place where foreign investors look at India. As we saw, as we have seen, Vietnam has been a big beneficiary of when people move out of China. One important point India should put in mind and the government should also look at is how can we become part of the global value chain or the global supply chain? Because that is very, very important to keep us take us to a different level and just not involve in our standard trade practices. So I think that would be good. And also one very important point that has come out over the last few years is how do you ensure that there is flow of knowledge and technology available, a free flow of knowledge and technology. As you know, a few hundred years, India actually dominated the world in terms of its own critical technologies uh, it had developed, for example, zinc smelting, woods, um, uh, steel, and then, of course, your high-grade textiles, which helped India, uh, you know, dominate the global trade. And I think it is time now for the government to work and to ensure that there is a continued flow of knowledge and technology, which is open and freely available and not tied to ownership of capital and access to market, because I think this would be good. And I want to give an example out here. If you look at when AT&T was um, uh, this thing, uh, um, uh, your companies like uh, Facebook, companies like Google, Amazon actually grew because you should allow the startups. And I think it's good time if India also works to allow Indian uh, uh, ecosystem uh, to make sure that the Indian startups get a level playing field where they can actually go. It's a big challenge for the government to balance between protecting the Indian industry and allowing FDI inflow because we cannot stop FDI inflow from coming into the country because India needs capital, India needs technology. And I think it's important that policies are made which are actually uh, uh, not protectionist in nature and allowing these foreign flow. Uh, with the changes in the Indian investment policy, be able to attract foreign investors to invest in India. What are the investment themes that will shape the FDI market in the future? How do we work on the perception of foreign investors as they look at India? And we will be discussing all this in the panel today. And hopefully we can cover all these uh, topics during this, uh, this time. We have a very distinguished panel out here. We have Girish Bhagat, founding partner, No Gen X Global Technology Partners India. We have San, uh, Vijay Sambamurthy, part founder and managing partner, Lexigen India. We have Aditya Burlia, founder, uh, Swaran Apijay Journalism Foundation India. Sudha Bhushan, co-founder, tax expert, professionals India. And uh, at the moment, we are not joined, but we also have Yogesh Singh, 
who is the national co-head of the corporate practice and partner tri legal with this i want to start the session um, and i would like to go to girish first girish how do you see the changes in the fdi policy over the years have impacted uh, fdi into india thank you richard first let's just look at the key numbers of what have been the fdi flows over the years 2014 india was attracting only 24 billion us dollar in 2019 this number more than double and to 51 billion usd in 2020 despite the pandemic between until august from january to august india clocked 44 45 billion okay much of it was due to reliance geo and reliance retail expectations are that 2024 india will be at 100 billion usd india is already amongst the top 5 FDI reception countries which basically means the confidence of foreign investors in the indian market in india's manufacturing capabilities and its india's ability to manufacture from here and export we expect and expectations are that in the next few years india will be amongst the top 3 after us and china let's now look at what have been the key policies time is short i just touched upon two three policy frameworks that have actually facilitated and which augur well for the foreign direct investments in into india mm-hmm. in 2016 india opened up food processing and allowed a 100% fti impact 2019 we received over 900 million dollars of fti in food processing sector alone up by 44% from the previous year in the same year india opened up a foreign direct investment uh, actually made foreign direct investment under automatic approval rule okay under the defense sector from 49% to 74% that's what was the impact this year in the last 6 months august april to september it has been 406 million dollars 406 million dollars of us uh, into defense sector and in 2001 to 2016 17 it was meager 7 to 8 million dollars so this has been a huge transformation effect post covid government did a phenomenal brought in a phenomenal policy measure exactly in the way it wanted to position itself as a global supply player its own aspirations of being self reliant which you call atmanirbhar okay meeting the requirements of the global players to de deconcentrate the supply chain and also bearing in mind the holistic spirit of development of Of, of creating uh, of creating jobs and and spruising up our exports, they introduced a scheme called pr- pr- production linked incentives plan, which basically is four to six percent of incentive on your incremental production. Initially, the scheme was announced only for the global uh, electronic majors, large electronic majors, and the, the bulk drugs, as also to the medical diagnostics. Earlier this month. or maybe late october it was expanded to 10 other sectors including food and other sectors what has been the impact let's just see 20 global electronic majors have lined up to set up manufacturing facilities in india signed up investments over 100 billion dollars in this field impact of these investments in the next 5 years is by 2025 according to a press report of the cabinet minister last few days 94 billion will be at export just from these incremental investments in the next over the next 5 years job employment this sector alone is going to create 800000 jobs over the next few years mobile handset it's just creating 50000 jobs in the next year this has been a huge impact okay and this is where decongestion is taking place from china and coming into india equally equally in the pharmaceutical where our backyard of dependence on china is there we have received 136 pharma some global players to set up the bulk drug manufacturing in india so this gigantic push and i can tell you from the ground level as you know that i have been in the space of bringing fdi we are a niche company bringing small companies but over the since 2011 to now i have brought in 35 companies to india and this policy changes the ground reality i'm sensing between the last few months today i'm sitting on a pipeline of more than a 10 year of effort my pipeline is more than 35 companies today okay from what all it did was it's clearly showing huge amount of investor confidence 
uh, the the government has responded to the challenge is moving on with the policy maker in the right direction so it is become india has become a more a favorable destination for foreign investments thank you <clears throat> thank you girish i think a very positive start um, uh, to the uh, to uh, to showing how much investment india can attract and also the policy changes that the government has made uh, so good for all people who are looking at india uh, very good start girish thank you uh, vijay i would like to come to you now uh, why do you think india has not been able to attract adequate fdi into the infrastructure sector what do you think the government can do to fix this good morning everybody and uh, thank you richard for that question because that's a topic which is uh, infrastructure is not only a, a practice area on which i focus very closely but it's a topic which is very close to my heart and something that i'm very passionate about because uh, you know as we all know infrastructure has the capability to you know spur a major domino effect on every economy and it's even more relevant and even more true in the case of an emerging economy like india's so uh, i think we made a great start with the infrastructure privatization concept in india when our economy was first liberalized back in early 90s and we started in fact with a big bang but that bang ended up in a bit of a uh, you know a bit of a flop show which was i'm talking about the dabol project which was a very huge uh, power project which many of us may recall where we brought in enron as the main uh, promoter of that project but somehow it was not to be and it didn't go the way that it should have gone or we would have hoped for it to have gone and that kind of dictated the pace for the next 10 years because the bad news from a big you know project failed project like that can be terrible so uh i'm you know particularly intrigued by this particular thing because recently i had the honor uh earlier this year to be appointed to the chief minister's special economic task force uh in the indian state of meghalaya which is one of the cleanest and uh, you know greenest states in india as i'm sure you will all agree and uh one of the discussions you know we centered around i mean the working group that i was a part of uh focused on infrastructure and labor and i would address two or three thing uh, two or three points which i made to the chief minister and to the working group uh in terms of reform while of course even compared to the rest of india meghalaya is a little uh, behind in terms of development or infrastructure i think many of the uh, lessons that i sought to kind of share with them are relevant Uh, to the rest of the country as well i think the first problem i would highlight is that our pace of regulatory approvals could do a lot better i think firstly we have a multitude of regulatory approvals required for every infrastructure project and the multitude of approvals not only uh, is like limited to central government we have certain you know approvals which are from the center certain approvals from the state and certain approvals from even local authorities so uh a single window clearance which works genuinely as it's supposed to uh, would make a big difference to giving confidence to international investors so many of them are a little uh you know scarred by other people's stories or by their own stories of you know running from pillar to post for regulatory approval so i would identify that as the first area where our country could do a lot better to attract more fdi in the infrastructure space uh the second area is in terms of ensuring that uh, the appropriate linkages are provided i mean it's not enough to just say that we will have an airport project or we'll have a port project or we'll have you know so many independent power projects sanctioned but we've got to create the facilitators to ensure that such projects don't fail but rather succeed in huge measure an, an example i will cite is that of fuel linkages a lot of the indian power projects uh, could have had a lot more success than they did and a lot of them unfortunately ended up as non performing assets uh, you know clogging up the banking system in india uh, primarily or at least in large measure because many of them uh, actually did not have the coal linkages or the coal supply secured so many of them uh were forced to you know think about importing coal which worked for a while because indonesian coal was available very cheap 
But when the Indonesians figured what was going on and changed the law, uh, placing restrictions on export of natural resources, again, it became a huge problem. And a lot of money that was poured into power projects, uh, you know, on the model of Indonesian coal being at a certain level, went through the roof because suddenly that, that became a 4x the cost of what they were originally talking about. So I think the second point is, therefore, the government has to create a, you know, clarity on fuel linkages, on transportation networks, on hinterland connectivity, and so on and so forth, so that the projects actually take off. The last point I would make is that we need a far more credible enforcement mechanism. I think we have a fantastic legal system. We have a you know, very, very good system of uh, judiciary and great set of laws. We have a common law model. We have a rule of law. But all that gets kind of undermined by the fact that there are uh, some examples cited where you know the system is not perceived as either being fast enough or fair enough uh, for even you know contractually agreed terms sometimes are not enforced. And that sends out a very bad message to the international market. So with that, I will stop and hand it back to you, Richard. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Vijay. Uh, for Vijay, can you put it on mute? Yeah, uh, Vijay, thank you very much, and uh, really appreciate you giving your real life examples. You are an infrastructure expert. You do a lot of work in that sector, and thanks for sharing it. And actually, this contractual uh, enforcement is one of the lowest which we come when it comes to um, ranking in the World Bank. Also, and I think a lot of work has to be done. Thank you for bringing that out, and I'm sh I hope the government works on it. Uh, Sudha, I'll come to you now. Uh, you have been extensively working with MNCs in their global structuring as they are looking to come to India. We understand that you have recently handled a huge $1 billion deal uh, involving assets in India. Congratulations for that at the outset. As far as tax is concerned, how do you think it can be made more conducive to investments in India? Thanks, Richard. Uh so as far as you know I, if you see as far as how we have been seeing is that there are two main regulatory considerations whenever there is an investment from outside so one is tax certainly one is a major component of the decision is one is taxation and other are the statutory requirement and all these tax and statutory requirement are needed to be seen at the time of entry at the time of operations and at the time of exit. Now, India has been progressively working to make it easy, determinate and predictive at all the three stages for everyone to invest in India, for everyone and anyone to invest in India. At the time of entry, we have very determinate policy, which is predominantly based on the sector in which the investment is sought to be made. Over the And over the pe uh, period of time, uh, almost all sectors, have been put in under the automatic route, which means that absolutely no regulatory approval required as far as RBI is concerned. So you, if you are falling into service sector and it's falling under the automatic, so they have come with a negative list now wherein no approval is required. In fact, even the sectors like defense as uh, Girish already spoke, it has been liberalized and now open for 100% open for uh, foreign investment. At the time of operations also, there is only one return that needs to be filed on annual basis with Reserve Bank of India. And there are lots of exit routes which are available to investors. Now, as far as tax is concerned, the good tax structure as we understand should have neutrality, efficiency, certainty, simplicity, effectiveness, fairness, and flexibility. And if you see the tech structure, one really will need to applaud, applaud for the India, India's uh, progressive steps that, that has been taken. I would call it a revolutionary work in the field of taxation. It has been ahead of the curve in the adoption of global best practices uh, from equalization levy to the uh, to country by country reporting and so many other uh, global best practice. And in fact, it has been ahead of the curve in adoption of significant economic presence and, uh, and uh, other ways of taxation. Now, a taxation, if you see, should produce the right amount of tax at the right time. 
and it should avoid both double taxation and unintentional non taxation as far as double taxation is concerned india has lot of huge treaty network that makes sure that there is no double taxation and we we understand that india got too much in debate over its retrospective amendment of act in the vodafone case however as we analyze the law with regard to indirect transfer while the assets are situated in india it is very fair law and a country cannot let go its revenue be it courteous transfer of underlying assets or be it uh, ever increasing presence of digital economy now both the investment and tax laws in india are very conducive and there is a definite endeavor by the government to make it more determinate user friendly and harmonized more so with the digitization of all the processes involved in the filings as well as now uh, the with the faceless assessment as well so we have started from the period wherein for the for the name approval we used to be in the queue and we are in the process that every other uh, filing that needs to be done with the reserve bank of india or be with the income tax it's online now so there is definitely a uh, endeavor in this direction thank you <clears throat> thank you sudha for sharing uh, because tax has always been a big issue when foreign investors come in they they don't understand the indian taxation rules and they are confused then people like you come and help them and uh, make them you know weave them through this uh, you know before this session we were discussing you know about uh, india and uh, how do you attract investments and aditya had some really nice points to share around perception because we all know perception is reality Aditya, can I take the liberty of asking you the question? Uh, what are your views of India can change or manage its perception from an outside investor perspective? From an outside investor perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajiv Ji. You know, I love how you set this up. I think we can all agree here uh, uh, that the perception of a country and an economy matters, and particularly uh, for a country like India, which has such global ambitions. how foreign investors of all sorts all across the world perceive us uh, really makes a difference now our prime minister prime minister modi has done an absolute incredible job over the past 6 years of of you know uh, going out first i think the i think the number of kilometers he's he's tracked on a plane is extremely rare for a, a world leader and his focus has primarily been to go to nation with a very sharp focus on investment into india and and as and and as girishi has said that bears out in the numbers however all the great work uh, done on the ground by the government all the great work done by the government outside india in really convincing investors all this wonderful goodwill and brand image burnished is often ripped to shreds you know by singular actions done without thought or care often by very low level functionaries in the government and you know there are lots of examples of this in india's now world famous time machine which was earlier used with impunity you know the pockets of tax terrorism that rippers up across uh, the news waves some white papers and reports that are often floated and leaked uh, you know there have been some unilateral renegotiations of government contracts by very local bodies and of course you know um, a multitude of random announcements uh by even some of our senior ministers that have been hastily walked back and scrapped now to be quite frank incidents such as these are often very isolated and quite frankly meaningless to a broader investment decision in the country and the experience of what india is on the ground but they tend to pour a lot of cold water on the grand efforts by the government to portray india as a business friendly country and a globally competitive investment decision now given how important fdi is to india in these times particularly after covid 19 you know i am of the favor that any decisions or acts or modifications or announcements needs to now go through an intra ministerial government panel that asks only one question will this announcement this decision big or small encourage or discourage investments into india and then even if they want to say okay let's still go with the controversial one put it into proper context often the news cycle runs away with it without actually looking at the details now part of the problem is cause is that many officers and ministers don't see the long term ramifications of their announcement they don't understand 
how their actions fit into a greater and broader sense of trust of the Indian ecosystem. They are just trying to solve a local problem. Of course, they might be, uh, there also might be uh, some sort of training program established to to for you know particularly critical uh, uh, posts to show that look your words and deeds are not just for the local audience. They are going to be replayed at a global uh, stage. You know that said, we also need to educate prospective investors. India is a large federal country with many many states competing for your business. Often one state will make a no, let's say foolish announcement or have certain rowdy incidents and that does not represent the entire country not by far and in fact many states will actually compete against those and say look we have a much better stable government and policies and, I, and, I, and just as a last bit i mean just look at the uh, the events that have happened in the united states over the past 6 months you know without the lens of context one might take away that, you know, it is a lawless land with riots on the streets and governments falling and, you know, uh, uh, you know, buildings being set on fire and, you know, the country is about to fail and fall. Why would I invest in that? But put into context, you realize that there's an isolated instance in a much broader story and economy. And India is going through incredible reforms. And I think having a, a systematic way to manage how information flows go out to uh, to foreign investors uh, you know that has to be a, a government priority and we have to make sure that these reforms are properly acknowledged and given due credit uh, <clears throat> thank you uh, Aditya uh, and uh, the fact that you have uh, spoken about the perception and we all know perception is uh, what actually defines a country and India unfortunately has been the receiving end of some of it you know some few things and we just got hammered for it uh, but you rightly said the prime minister has really worked hard to change the image of India. And we have seen it. I mean, Girish has given the numbers. He's given the uh, FDI inflow. And we all know India needs a lot of capital. In fact, India's entire growth story from 1991 has been linked, has been linked with the FDI inflows. Whenever we saw good FDI inflows, we saw India growing. Despite some of the challenges that people have come here, understood the market, understood how you do. And I think uh, I think the panel members have raised a very good point. India is not one approval. You've got the uh, central government, you have state government, you have local bodies. And I think we uh, all investors should understand it. But one very good thing has happened and which I thought I'll share here is we have brought in this competitive federalism in India where we're getting the states to compete with each other. And that is now it's no more investing into India. One is looking at investing into a state, into a particular area, because that state is offering a great investment. So I think that's a good thing that has happened and we must compliment the government for that act at least. Now what I'm going to do is considering we have discussed everything, we unfortunately Yogesh was not able to join us because he couldn't uh, log on and we missed out the legal angle of it, uh, which we wanted to cover. But I just thought, considering that we have gone through all these points, the good points, the challenges that India is going through, I want to ask the panel members one question and I'll come to you one by one to answer this. What are the transformational reforms required, which in many ways can be game changers? You can give one or two, three, whatever you feel uh, you want to give. And Aditya, I'll start with you first. Uh, uh, because you have actually laid the ground to answering this question. I mean, your uh, you have laid it. So I will come to you first. What are the uh, transformational reforms required? Uh, Sajiri, I would like to talk more on a macro uh, basis on this. You know, I view India often as a very acknowledged uh, supercomputer, which is being run on an operating system more suited for a handheld watch or something. It works. It can be pretty. It's nice, but it cannot unleash the power and potential of the entire country. I know the laws and tools what we are talking about are still very much based on 18th and 19th century, um, you know, uh, uh, bases and philosophies, and most of them have been sort of band-aided for the modern world. Now, let us be clear: this is true for almost, you know, all the countries who have been around for a while. That you have old institutions which have just sort of stumbled into the 21st century. And I think in, in terms of India, 
you know, we have a small window of opportunity. We are still far too obsessed with tweaking one law here or a few percentage on here. You know, the government invites all of us to come in and give them wish lists. Okay, okay, one law here or one law here. But India post COVID-19 has the ability to do incredible what I like to call leapfrog reforms. And that is to scrap a lot of these old laws in entirety and bring in 21st century laws and systems for to lay the foundations of a modern economy and maybe even a modern society. And I bring this into context because we have a government right now that is not afraid of making bold decisions. This is a government that within a few years of power ended up doing de demonetization, which was an absolute and incredible risk. And so when we talk about reforms, I think right now we should be talking about reforms of that scale and substance. You know, India has pretty much everything, a young population, a diverse geography and land, abundant natural resources, a huge uh, strategic access and importance because of where it is, reasonably stable institutions. You know, very few countries in the world can claim this. And we have the uh, the social and put and the political incentive. This is not some pipe dream of somebody saying, "Oh, we should be a better country." But it's an existential crisis. You know, 15 million young people are looking for jobs every year. 15 million, and that's an entire European country. So, by definition, India is scale, and therefore our reforms have to be that high and game changing. And we are competing now against the entire world, even countries like the like the U.S are saying that we want to bring back manufacturing. And for those in the audience, you have gotten phone calls from the U.S. saying that, guys, let's bring you in and we are willing to pay to play. India uh, is also not just just uh, competing against the local uh, uh, normal competitors. I mean, we've stopped competing against China for the most part, I think, for the last 10, 15 years. China is, in fact, moving up the value chain. That's an incredible opportunity for India. But we normally talk about Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, uh, Bangladesh and others. If we really want to compete, it's just not enough to say, hey, we have a great market. We really need some of those game changing uh, reforms. And, you know, I won't go into a list. There's almost 20, 30 very low hanging fruit from, you know, uh, having having the metric system actually take place for land or, you know, moving to a completely automated uh, regulatory system. All of it, by the way, has been piloted and has shown great confidence. And the great news that I keep saying is that we are seeing the willingness of the government to listen, to talk about this. And, and my sincere hope is in the next one year, we will see many of these reforms come out. We've seen some of them already in place. But I, I continuously look at India as, you know, for the next five years, if it can even bring in one or two of, of those major reforms, it will truly become not number 67, 68 best places to invest, but can leapfrog to top five, top 10. Sure. Thanks, Yogesh. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, sorry. Thanks, Aditya. Uh, Yogesh, welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> on Yogesh, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, 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 Yogesh, welcome. I know you had challenges joining. Uh, so uh, can I take the liberty of asking you a question straight away as you've come? I know you've not warmed up yet. So... No, uh, no uh, uh, considering that you have been dealing with cross-border M&A and corporate finance deals for several years, can you pick out three to four major legal reforms? And we are talking of reforms now, basically the reforms. So maybe, you know, it will come in that context. Uh, legal reform that you think would help in facilitating investments into India. I think, uh, <clears throat> Richard, if I can take the liberty of uh, starting with just the more philosophical point, which uh, from what I heard a little bit Aditya speaking about, um, I think people do recognize there are the ABCs of attracting the right amount of investment. None of us uh, over here are going to deny that India needs major amount of investment, uh, especially a lot of cross-border investment as well. And uh, the ABCs basically are A for acknowledge, acknowledge that we need to do more. Acknowledge that while we've done all right, but we can do much more. B is go big. Uh, we need to not be thinking about, uh, and this government has done a fantastic job of stacking up a bunch of reforms, which all comes together as major reform. But I think we have to think of going big. Just think of uh, the insolvency in bankruptcy court kind of reform. 
which is completely a game changer. We probably still haven't seen the results of that, but that is the kind of level at which we have to think of reform. C, I think, is the most important. It is consistency and clarity. Uh, whatever we do, we need to be clear that we are looking to attract capital, and we have every potential, every right resource, every reason to attract it. But we need to be consistent. Uh, I think, more or less, in the last three years, we've seen a fair bit of consistency. But uh, consistency and clarity both are very, very important. So let me then very quickly jump on to Richard. And pardon me if I take another thirty seconds. Uh, uh, for that, but this is three, four key legal reforms. If we look at it, and I am a M and A and corporate finance practitioner, sure. I feel that uh, a lot of the deals uh, get impacted because of business climate and not because of FDI reforms as well. But keeping that in mind, uh, some of the key things that we should be looking at is allowing optionally convertible securities as a viable mechanism for foreign investment. Uh, Indian companies have grown wiser. Uh, they know how to negotiate. I can tell you that as a in, sometimes representing investor, sometimes representing promoter, there, 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 the deals are negotiated at a very, very uh, nuanced level and people understand what it is. So we don't need that protectionist regime when it comes to companies raising uh, millions of dollars of capital. Uh, we should be thinking of pre-packaged insolvency petitions. Uh, I wouldn't get into too much detail, but essentially if a company is going bankrupt, uh, instead of only waiting for some third party suitor to take over, it is better to also allow the promoter to work out a plan and that is called a pre-packaged insolvency process. We need to be allowing, um, uh, we should be removing a lot of the red tape from uh, uh, of which are mandatory processes around mergers and acquisitions to the, and I'm talking about court approved mergers where um, majority of the shareholders and lenders have already approved, provided consent. We don't need to go through having the process of creditor approvals and shareholder approvals if those are provided upfront. Uh, then I think uh, last one that I would talk about or last two ones that I'll quickly mention are giving better access to bond markets to Indian corporates. We need to recognize that they need capital and they have the ability to raise the right capital. And the last piece, which is the most important, I think, is in the dispute resolution processes. When some of us in the look at our arbitration clauses, uh, we find it very difficult to tell people that even after winning an arbitration award, you may have to go through a long process of enforcement. Or if you've got a fantastic interim relief order from an emergency arbitrator, you don't even know whether it's going to be enforceable in India because you will have to bring that award into India and re-agitate it under Section 9 of the Arbitration Act. So some of those things, we need to recognize that we are at a mature level and move ahead. Uh, I don't want to take too much time, especially given uh, I am the one to blame for not being able to log in early. But I'll, I'll pause here in case any questions sure. come up later, then I'm happy to take. Sure. Thanks, uh, Yogesh. And uh, uh, I will come to Vijay. Vijay, can you talk of the three, uh, two or three transformational reforms that you, from your point of view, would like to share? Sure, Richard. So firstly, I completely echo the sentiments of Aditya and Yogesh in that I think on two counts. One is, I think any reform we talk about now has to be big ticket reform. We have had too many tweaks and too many so minor modifications. That kind of stuff keeps happening. Government, if it needs to you know, make some transformational change, they have to make transformational reforms. They cannot expect incremental reforms to result in transformational change. So that's the first point I would make. Secondly, coming to a specific I will, uh, you know, uh, I will take a, you know, what Yogesh said a step further, many steps further, actually, and say that the biggest reform in my mind that the government needs to think about and why I say this is that this government has done some pretty uh, bold and audacious things, right, which previous governments maybe were a little nervous to try out. So a good level of that kind of audacity is needed now. And what I'm talking about is that the government should very strongly consider diluting very, very substantially the exchange control laws of India. I think 90% of FEMA no longer has any relevance in my view. 
I think India should move towards a more open economy in terms of its uh, in terms of its equity inflows and outflows. And I'm talking about both ways. There are Indian corporations which are global now. More and more Indian companies and uh, even Indian uh, individual investors are wanting to take part in the global story. So there should be no restriction on you know money coming in. There should be no restrictions on money going out. And what should be governed is making sure that everything is done through normal banking channels and there's no money laundering and stuff like that. But I think if exchange controls are done away, the flight of capital that is happening right now will be avoided. Because I think all of us know that a lot of good companies in India are now looking to kind of re-domicile themselves in an indirect way through some creative structuring. And you can't blame them. You know, they are trying to get access to the best capital. They're trying to get best, uh, you know, access to uh, liquidity by, you know, say, IPOing on NASDAQ. So I think Indian government should, instead of feeling insecure about it, they should take a much more secure approach and start thinking big and start thinking like a first world country. I think that's the way for us to get there. Thank you, Vijay. Uh, okay, we have uh, about uh, three minutes. Vijay, can you? Yeah, thanks. Uh, we just got now three minutes left and uh, Sudha and Girish have to go. Sudha, let, let it be a rapid round. Just give two or three reforms and Girish can also end up with the last year. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll just give the, give the key ones which I really feel can really help India grow in leaps and bounds. One is taking and taking the benefit of digitalization. So I, I see that digitalization is a very big opportunity for India to come at the equal footing. And so India should be able to provide the definitive digital regulations in terms of data privacy law and digital taxes and also laying down of adequate infrastructure. So this this is the one. And the second one is that India should be should lay very clear foreign policy. So what we have been seeing that India is on the mute mode when it comes to the uh, relevant development, global development. You see the, that we have stepped out of RCEP or uh, while it uh, it comes to the discussion with WTO on uh, the multilateral framework or to the investment. We are on the mute mode. So if we have a clear foreign policy, it will be uh, very good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sudha. Girish, over to you. Sorry, just okay. only one minute. One and very quickly, I'll give three points which haven't been covered at a re release arrest. Yes. One, as we India gears up as manufacturing capacity goes up on high-tech manufacturing, we need to pay attention to our vocational skill training. That's where the huge gaps today the new economic education policy, new education policy lays a framework, but the implementation of building a vocational force is going to be challenged going forward in easing out the innocent. Second, land infrastructure, which is going to be a big thing, which Vijay talked about earlier. We need a very clear cut policy on land acquisition. This is where much of our infrastructure projects have been bogged down and we need to sort that out. Third, is as companies are looking at, businesses are looking at relocating the facilities from China specifically in India, there is a need now to address at the very clear specific levels, what are the custom processes of importing a second-hand machine? Let's not expect de novo new investments. There is a machine lying outside, they have to be brought in here. They have run, their life of the machines could be well over 25, 30 years. But if it gets bogged down in the custom processes because a second-hand machine, what's the duty to be paid? Government needs to be very alert on that. Last but not the least, a point Yogesh went, I said, judicial, we have a good judicial framework, but the process has to be made far more efficient. That's it from me. Uh, thank you, panel members, and appreciate everybody joining and giving your valuable insights, and a good day to everybody. Thank you. We managed on time. So okay. that you are very popular. You're getting a lot of good comments. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Everyone, please wait.